Joy for that introduction. Um, yeah, that TED Talk, it's, uh, somebody told me the other day it has uh, 35,000 views, but um, most of those are my mother. <laughs> <laughs> Some of them are not. Do you okay. need to be a little I think this will work. <laughs> She's coming to save me from myself. clear arguments to respond with. Um, and then I was also asked to briefly touch on why some parents pursue heritage language education for their children and others resist it. And what can we do to hypnotize, no, change the mind of those who resist it, right? Okay, so I'm sure most people in this room know that around the world, we don't know exactly how many people are bilingual or multilingual, but we know it's somewhere between 50 and 65 percent. So that's the majority of human beings on this planet are bilingual or multilingual, right? Okay, what about the United States? Raise your hand if you think the uh, proportion of the U.S. population who says that they speak another language other than English in the home, okay? Is that perfect? No, you might be bilingual and just not speak. You're not English language in the home. This is the closest we can get. Uh, from the U.S. Census. So raise your hand. You think it's zero to 25 percent speak a language other than English in the home? Okay. Raise your hand if you think it's 26 to 50 percent of people in this country say they speak. Okay. How many people say it's 51 to 75? Okay. And how many think it's got to be 76 to 100 percent? Okay. I'm about to burst a lot of bubbles here, y'all. Uh, the U.S. Census last asked this question in 2007, and it was 19.7%. So, no cheating. Raise your hand if you were in that first group who raised your hand. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so what this tells us is that we have a staunch, staunchly monolingual culture here in this country. Um, and that's not something in this room we think we should be proud of, but a lot of people sort of are. Uh, it's sort of part of our heritage, and I'm going to come back to that uh, in a moment. And I think, uh, in large part, the fact that we are so monolingual, and again, you might not notice it here in D.C., I don't notice it in Chicago. I mean, I leave my house and I walk to Walgreens, I hear 12 languages, right? It's a multilingual place. Yeah. But the country in general, again, 80% of people say they only speak English at home. Um, I think our, our, our monolingual culture owes itself to at least two factors, uh, two myths, right? The first, a lot of people think that multilingualism is somehow damaging to society, and others think that multilingualism is damaging to individuals. Now, we all know this is false, but again, it's helpful to have concrete data to respond to these people. First of all, uh, this is an oldie but a goodie. 1991, Joshua Fishman, right, one of the lead forefather of, of sociology of language, conducted a study in which he looked at 170 different countries that are uh, multilingual. He looked at 238 different factors. This is a major study. And what they found was that linguistic heterogeneity is not correlated with GNP or with social or civil conflict. So in other words, more languages does not mean Tower of Babel, everybody hates each other and they're all fighting, okay? 
Have you ever heard people say, well, look over at uh, Belgium. They hate each other because of the language. Look at Canada, they're having all these problems because of language. Look at, look at, look at. And the truth of the matter is, you can have conflicts between people who speak two different languages, but the language is the cause, right? So uh, a correlation does not indicate causality, right? What causes those kinds of conflicts are always going to be power, power relations, which is linked to capitalism, et cetera, et cetera. So this is absolutely not true. We can be a multilingual nation, right, speaking many different languages and still be very, very united, okay? Um, do you ever hear this from people about immigrant groups? Why don't they just learn English? Why don't they just learn English? I think everybody in this room joins me in saying, yes, yes, they absolutely should learn English. Nobody's saying they shouldn't learn English, right? Um, what we are saying is why should you abandon your heritage language? Why is that you know, the cost of admission to this country, right? You gotta leave that at the door because we don't want it here. In fact, we're gonna see data in a minute that if you retain your heritage language, you'll actually get more English, right? Um, and the truth of the matter is, they do learn English. We all know this. Uh, immigrant communities shift entirely to English very quickly. It's typically within three generations, okay? Um, and this study also goes back quite a ways, but they looked at 35 different countries, right? I mean, it's pretty typical, isn't it, when someone immigrates to another country, that they learn the dominant language of that country. And unfortunately, it's also quite typical to lose your heritage language, okay? So we're not alone in the United States in this, but I think we could do a better job, okay? Um, the United States was the fastest. People who immigrate here compared to immigrating to other places, they learn English the <coughs> fastest and lose their heritage language the fastest. That tells you something about the pressures, and we're gonna talk about that too, and this really, really, this pressure we have, right, uh, of a monolingual culture. Uh, in fact, here are the uh, top 10 non-English languages spoken in the United States. Raise your hand if your language is on this list. Who are my top teners in here? Very nice, okay. Um, the census, oh, you can't read that top line. The census asks people, do you speak English well, very well, <coughs> not very well, or not at all? Those are the four categories, right? Uh, and this data I'm gonna show you right now is the percentage of speakers of these languages in the US who say they speak English well or very well. Now, what do you think? Do people tend to overestimate their English abilities or do they tend to underestimate? They tend to underestimate. They say, yeah, no, I don't speak it that well. And they, they, they're really quite proficient. So the numbers I'm gonna show you are actually probably lower than reality. This is the percent. So the people who run around, you know, immigrants today aren't learning English. Where are they looking? I don't know where they're looking because everywhere I look, I'm seeing acquisition of English and also loss of heritage languages, okay? So the pattern goes something like this. You have a person who immigrates from another country. Uh, very frequently, they're, they're monolingual in their language, right, that they speak, okay? Uh, will this person learn English? Let's say she arrives here at 30 years old. Will she learn English? Yes, probably. Some will learn it more than others. Um, some people work, you know, 8, 10, 12, 15, 18 hours a day. They don't necessarily have time to go to ESL classes. ESL classes cost money. ESL classes might be far away from where they live. They might have young children they have to take care of. There are a number of reasons why people don't uh, acquire English as quickly as some might want. But anyway, so you have this lady here. She comes to the US and she has her daughter. Is her daughter going to know English? Of course, she's raised here, she's schooled here entirely in English. Is she going to speak the heritage language? Probably, because that's the only thing her mother and father speak. Particularly if she's the oldest child, right? We all know the older children speak the heritage language more strongly than the younger children. Part of the reason for that is that the younger kids have the older kids speaking in English to them, right? Also, as time goes on, the parents have learned more and more English. If the first kid tries to talk English to the parent, what does the parent say? I don't understand you, speak to me in whatever it is, right? Um, but by the time the second, third, fourth, fifth kid comes along, 
right? They can respond in English, and the parent's already so thinking, okay, the parent is tired, and the parent understands more, right? In fact, a grad student of mine did a study. Not only does heritage language proficiency decline with increasing birth order, you know what also changes is the naming practices. My student looked at Spanish, uh, you know, Latino families, and she found that kid number one and kid number two, their names are like Guadalupe and Jesus and things like that. Kid number four is Tiffany and <laughs> Brittany and Jonathan, right? So the language skills are going, the ethnic names are going. Um, ethnic food practices tend to stick around. You can be fourth or fifth generation, you're still eating the ethnic food. Once the ethnic food is gone, that's it. <laughs> that's it. But language is the first to go, right? Well, besides clothing, clothing is usually first, and then language is not too far. Okay, so this gal, we said, is going to learn English. Her English is going to be stronger than her heritage language, isn't it? Okay. Uh, if she goes to the home country regularly, her heritage language will be stronger. If uh, she uh, speaks to relatives in the home country, if she goes to a Saturday school or a heritage language school, her heritage language will be stronger. Okay, so now she goes ahead and has a kid. Is this kid going to know any of the heritage language? <laughs> it depends. If grandma lives in the house, in Spanish we call that the abuela factor. The abuela factor is very important, right? If she lives in the house, this child will probably know a lot of the heritage language. If mom sends him to a heritage language school, a dual language school, if he spends his summers in the country of his family, then he will probably know. But what typically happens, unfortunately, is this kid, he might understand some of the heritage language, but he does not speak it. And then when he has a kid, kaput, gone, no more. Okay? Uh, this has been happening since the 19th century. It happened to the Italians, the Poles, the Germans, to a great extent. Um, and it still continues today. In fact, they're saying that it's happening more quickly today. We are seeing parents, particularly, my understanding is, uh, among Vietnamese communities in Los Angeles, parents cannot speak to their own children. And as a parent myself, I just I can't imagine anything more devastating, right? This is a one-generation language shift. Okay, uh, so it's, the shift is happening more quickly than it did in the past. Some people say languages come here to die. Okay, it doesn't have to be that way. Uh, you know, another way to say this is shift happens. Oh, <laughs> get it? Shift happens. Right? <laughs> yeah, it's funny, but it's not. <laughs> oh, she just got it. There we go. <laughs> um, <laughs> so you know what's not helping us? Is this English only official English legislation? Do you know how many states have English, official English legislation? Anybody know? 31. <gasps> wow. 31 states have official. Now, in some states like mine, in Illinois, this really means nothing. It was passed in 1969, it's on the books, but it means nothing. It's just symbolic. But you know what we decided to do in Chicago? We decided to fight symbolism with symbolism. And we, before Mayor Daley stepped down, got him to sign a resolution stating that Chicago is a multilingual city. How can you have a multilingual city in an official English state? Again, it just shows you that the official English is kind of bogus. So if you live in one of the states that is blue, and this isn't Democrat, Republican, okay? This is all English, right? Blue means official English, so blue is bad here. Um, blue is the official English. If you live in one of these, uh, see if you can do that. See if you can either strike it from the books altogether, legally, and if you can't, see if the mayor of your city or town will declare it, and if you go to multilingualchicago.org, you can see, or just write me, and I'll send it to you, the actual resolution. So you don't have to write a resolution from scratch, but give you our resolution, change, fill in your city for Chicago and give it to your mayor, and see if they'll send it. Um, only four states have any kind of protected bilingualism, okay? Alaska, is the most recent one. Uh, Hawaii, Louisiana, New Mexico, Alaska, that's it. Those are the only places where bilingualism is legally protected. Everywhere else, all kinds of discrimination is possible for, for non-English languages. It also happens not just in legal realms, it happens on the street. <coughs> Idaho bus driver fired for pouring water on Latino eighth grader telling him to speak English. This was last month, September. 
Uh, two students assaulted on a train in Arizona for speaking Mandarin. Students suspended for speaking Native American language in the classroom. A classmate asked her, how do you say love? And she said it, and she got suspended. Because you're not supposed, the teacher said, you might be talking about me. Um, man kicked off flight for speaking Arabic. This is happening a lot, like today. And this woman who was assaulted in an Applebee's north of Minneapolis, the, the woman who hit her with a glass beer mug, um, said she just didn't want to hear a language other than English. And she kept telling her to stop. And this woman was saying, no, I have a right to speak whatever I want. And, then so, and you might say, well, this is just isolated cases of crazy violent people. But it's happening all over the place. And I have a very, um, it's a sad web page um, on Kuchowski.org where um, I document these cases. I don't know if you can see it there at the bottom. But um, it's just linguistic repression. If you Google my last name in linguistic repression, it'll come up. So every time I see one of these, I post it up here. Um, just because people often don't believe me. They don't believe me. They say, well, we have right to free speech, don't we? I said, yeah, we do. But you know, look at what's happening. So this, this is what you all, we all, are fighting against. We're fighting against a country where this happens, OK? Um, so what is heritage language good for? First of all, slowing down that intergenerational shift, right? We don't need to be the country that languages go to die. We can help people sustain their heritage languages and learn English, OK? It is also good for educating parents and youth to develop pride in their languages. So, and maybe, maybe we can reduce these cases of linguistic repression by having people know their rights, OK? Um, when you think about how much money we spend as a country on learning foreign world languages, okay, why should we squander the, the resources we have right here? They already have linguistic, a kid who shows up at five years old speaking Hindi to kindergarten knows more linguistically and culturally right, than an adult who starts at age 20 could probably ever, unless they really like went to India for 10 years. right. Um, this is a fantastic resource. We as a nation need to start looking at this as a resource, okay? You've probably seen this chart before. Some people argue about this chart, right? Um, the number of hours it takes to learn another language. So those that are considered closely related to English, I know here we have some German, we have French, Spanish. I think those are the only ones that you named, Joy, that we have Portuguese. today. Portuguese, yes. So about 600 to 700 hours of classroom instruction in order to ask where's the bathroom, you know? Basic proficiency. Uh, who are my Russian Russian people here? Yeah. Okay. Uh, over a thousand hours to be able to do basic things in Russian. Mandarin, Cantonese, Japanese, Korean, Arabic, where are you? Right? Over 2,200 hours. Uh, I apologize that I don't have data for, for ASL, how long it, it takes to, uh, to learn that. Um, someone should have that somewhere. We can, we can find that out. Um, anyway, what do we do when a kid shows up to school and speaks Hindi or speaks Chinese or speaks whatever it is? What do we do? We try to erase it from them. Right? Either through neglect or through active discrimination. Do not speak Spanish in my classroom, right? As a nation, we're also not super red hot at learning foreign or world languages, right? You probably have heard this joke. What do you call a person who speaks three languages? Trilingual. What do you call a person who speaks two languages? Bilingual. What do you call a person who speaks one language? <laughs> right? Um, we have 40 years of research, 40 years of research. That says that if you begin learning the language before approximately age 10, it actually goes to a different part of your brain. It's what neurolinguists are calling organic memory. Okay, so we know this. But what do we do in this country? When do we think is a good time to start learning other languages? Seventh grade, if you're lucky. A lot of people have to do it in high school. Okay, that is just way too late. And then what do you get? You get people who say, I studied three years of Spanish in high school and I can't remember anything. And they're like proud of that? You know, like that didn't stick to me by golly, I'm a true American. I don't get it. It's a really pervasive and pernicious attitude that we have here. So to summarize what we've said so far, heritage speakers, we neglect or actively erase heritage languages from children. 
when they turn 14, we allow them, okay, now you can study a language. What about all those years when literacy could be developed, et cetera? And then for new or foreign second language learners, we start way too late. And I gotta say, it's still happening today. The communicative revolution, yeah, some people didn't get that memo, okay? Uh, they're still focusing on grammar exercises, <coughs> drill and kill, rather than real life communication and culture. So we're not doing a real great job. Okay, so we've seen that multilingualism is not damaging to society. What about this other myth that multilingualism is damaging to individuals? Everybody here in this room knows, and probably your Facebook blows up just like mine does. It seems like every month, or twice a month, right? Some university or someone will publish a study about how bilingualism is awesome. The advantages of bilingualism. But many parents are scared. They're scared that, uh, or, or they're not aware, okay? But their fear is that their kids won't learn English well enough or fast enough, okay? How many of you have seen this documentary, Speaking in Tongues? If you have not seen this documentary, Speaking in Tongues, I highly, raise your hands again. Okay, I highly recommend, that's your homework, the rest of you, you gotta go out and see this film, Speaking in Tongues. It's very, very worthwhile. It's about dual language uh, education. So you've got some parents beating down doors, waiting in line, you know, elbowing each other to get their kids into dual language schools, right? That teach in two languages. And then in this film, you will see interviews with parents who are much more reticent. The Mexican dad on the left says, I can teach Spanish here at home. What my daughter needs is English, English, English in school. And then the Chinese father on the right is very angry and he says, there's only two and a half hours a day in English, and we're in America. He wants his children to have more English as well, okay? Um, what the research shows us, however, is something that is, is counterintuitive, and it's something we need to get these parents to understand. Some of these parents, I think, their fear, <coughs> excuse me, comes from a misguided notion uh, that their kids are, are somehow <coughs> gonna be confused. So there's a lot of people who should know better, including teachers, uh, who tell parents, don't speak Chinese to your kid, they'll get confused. Don't speak Spanish to your kid, they're gonna get confused. I had a hairdresser from Greece, and I asked her one day, so how's your daughter's Greek going? Oh no, I stopped, because she was getting confused. And this poor woman, you know, she cuts the hair of a linguist. So I sat there and I gave her the whole spiel. No, you've got to keep it. She's just like trying to get me out the door. Like, no, you have to, you have to, you have to. Um, so I think uh, part of the reason people tell us this, how many people have heard this? Kids get confused. Every, almost every hand. Look around, do it again. How many of you have heard, look at this. People are working against us legally People are working against us on the street. I mean, it's, it's you people are angels, the kind of work you're doing to, to, to counter this kind of thing, okay? Some of them are afraid that children will not learn English well, okay? Um, and we know that this is not true. Uh, I'll give you some data from schools in a minute, but I'll tell you right now about a study that was done in Boston. I think it was like 200 and something families. Half the families, uh, Spanish-speaking Latino recent arrival families, Half the families, the mothers said, oh my God, my kid's gonna get confused, I'm going to speak English to my kid. Whatever English they happen to have, they were gonna do it. The other half of the mothers said, nah, en esta casa se habla español. And they continued in Spanish with their kids. And they measured the kid's English development, and guess what? It was the same. The kid's English development was the same. You know what was different between those two groups of kids? The Spanish. The Spanish of the kids whose mothers had shifted to English plummeted. They did not have as much vocabulary. But the kids, so that's a no-brainer, isn't it? Okay. Um, another thing people think is that children will be confused, right? Um, do you remember the first slide when we talked about what percentage of people on this planet are bilingual or multilingual? What was the number? 50 to 65? Right. So are all those kids confused? Were they all confused? Or is it probably more likely that the human brain is wired to be bilingual? That monolingualism is weird, right? Monolingualism is kind of like something we need to cure, <laughs> don't you think? Um, that, that's my sense of the matter, anyway. Um, I think people mistakenly believe 
that the practice of code switching is a sign of confusion, okay? And we know it is not random confusion. We know that it follows certain rules, okay? That's why when I see students at the University of Illinois who say, oh, I speak Spanglish, and they're like embarrassed about it, or they say, I speak Chinglish, or I speak Arabish, right? I always tell them, you should be proud of that. That shows that you have very strong syntax <laughs> in both languages. People whose Arabic is very weak, guess what? They don't speak Arabish, they speak English. So the fact that you're speaking Arabish <laughs> is a very good thing. Now, can we help you to strengthen your Arabic so that you can have monolingual conversations? Of course we can, that's our goal. But never be ashamed, don't let anybody shame you. And you wanna know the saddest thing? Do you wanna know who shames young people for the ways that they mix languages? Their own parents. Their own parents shame them for the ways that they speak. And I would like to submit to you that that's not a good idea. That it's much better to praise our children for when they're making attempts. Realize that when you're raised in the United States, this happens. It happens all over the world. Okay? It is not a sign of laziness. Look, I have two legs. And I use them both when I walk. Nobody says I'm lazy because I don't hop around on one leg all the time. Okay? Our kids have two languages and they're going to use them both. It's perfectly normal. Okay? Um, so this is not a sign of random confusion. In fact, it's also developmental. Younger kids will do things that older kids don't. Uh, who are my Spanish speakers here? Just very quickly, I'm going to give you a couple of examples, and I apologize. I don't have, I only raised my kids in Spanish. I didn't raise them <laughs> in other languages, so I only had examples. But when they were little, um, mi marido le pisó al pequeño sin querer un día, and then he said, Ay, papi pissed me. <laughs> Instead of me piso, he pissed me. Yeah. Or another one, um, you know, you spend a lot of time telling your kids, no grites, no grites, don't shout, right? And then at one point, my husband was across the apartment and he shouted something to me. Y el grande botella, he said, papi, don't greet. <laughs> right? And I'm like, fuck. Of course, I run and I write them down. So they, and now they don't do that anymore. Of course, they code switch. But So what I'm trying to say to you is that there's different stages children will go through in their bilingualism, right? And again, what the media are showing us, what studies are showing us, is that bilingualism, your brain on bilingualism, right, leads to many, many advantages. We know very little about the brain. In fact, what a, a neurolinguist neuro told me <laughs> is that here's what we know about the brain. If you took a microphone and you hung it one mile above Beijing, that's what we know about the brain, what that microphone, you might pick up a fire over here and a something over there, but that's, that's about what we know. But what we do know is that socially, bilinguals have, did you see this one in the New York Times? Bilinguals have superior skills. We see the cognitive advantages. We also have here, I'm gonna ask you, this is a really important study. Um, raise your hand if you're bilingual. That should be everybody in this room, come on. Yeah, get your hands up, come on, I know y'all are bilingual. Okay. <coughs> Keep your hands up if, the, if you're trilingual, okay? Keep your hands up if you're quadrilingual. Woo! All right, keep those hands up because I'm gonna show people some data and looking at you, I think they're gonna agree. The number of languages you speak and how attractive you are. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you think that's true? Oh, yes. Right? I mean, I think this is fairly obvious. But on a more serious note, we do know that the age of onset of Alzheimer's is also delayed in bilingual, so we all know this. Why are we doing such a bad job getting this out to the public? I mean, it's coming out of news feeds in the New York Times, but your average person sitting in Applebee's north of Minnesota, or of Minneapolis, has other ideas about what this country is and what we should be speaking in this country. So how can we do this? How can we promote uh, better early language learning and get Homer Simpson to learn another language too, right? How can we cure this country's monolingualism? Uh, if you'll permit me, who are my dual language, two-way immersion educators here? Okay, I'm gonna be preaching to the choir with you, but for everybody else, go raise them again. If you have any questions about dual language education after this talk, go talk to them, because they work in dual language education, okay? Um, and that's what's profiled in this movie. When a child shows up to kindergarten and their English is considered not strong enough to, to, to function in the, in the all-English classroom. In this country, 
we give them typically three options. The first option is all English. Okay? Now, this all English must be, by law, accompanied by some kind of support. That could be ESL, it could be sheltered. It is illegal. Since 1974, it is illegal to take a child who does not speak English and immerse them, throw them in the pool with all English kids with no, uh, no help. Now, it happens every day. Between you and me, it happens every day. But it is illegal. Okay? The second program type is what we call bilingual. Now, you notice I have quotes around this word bilingual. Uh, I say this with all respect to my bilingual education colleagues um, who work very hard. But they agree with what I'm about to say. There's nothing bilingual about bilingual education. De bilingüe no tiene nada de educación bilingüe. Because what is the goal of bilingual education in this country? Acquisition of English. Get out of, to exit from the bilingual education program as quickly as possible. And what happens to your Chinese after that? What happens to your Arabic after that? We don't care. We don't care. As long as you're doing okay in English, that's all we care about. Um, the language, in this case I'm using Spanish as the example. It's used about 25% of the time. It's like a crutch. When you don't need a crutch anymore, do you still walk around with your crutch? No, you put it in the garage. That is how this is looked at. Um, and then the final model is um, what people call dual language or two-way immersion, okay? That's when anywhere from 50 to 90% of the curriculum is taught in the non-English language, okay? And it typically goes all the way up through eighth grade. Some of them are only uh, in the younger grades. And what's different about this program compared to those two programs, who enrolls in those two programs? Only the children that the school district has decided needs help in English. Guess who enrolls in these programs? You have children who are needing to learn English, but you also have children who speak English at home. And their parents have decided, you know what? I want to cure my child's monolingualism. And I'm going to send this kid to this school. And you see them sitting there the first day. I've seen videos, they're like, right? If, if you get that speak, not if, when you get that speaking in tongues documentary and you watch it, You'll see a little kid named Alex who's sitting in a Chinese, I believe it's Mandarin, immersion program. And the teacher is just talking to him and telling him to put his backpack away. And he's, he's able to do it, right? And then you see them eight years later, and it's amazing what they can do in Chinese. So anyway, it's for both kinds of kids. Now, I show this to parents. Um, in Chicago, they, off, they uh, invite me to parent groups, right, in schools, schools that want to start Spanish dual language programs. And so I go, well, even if they don't invite me, I show up anyway. Um, and I ask parents, so of these three program types, which do you think is going to end up in the highest levels of English language learning? And what do they always say? Was number one, English only. I mean, that's just logical, isn't it? The more English they teach my kid, the more English that kid is going to learn. And then I say, well, that's logical, but it's incorrect. And I show them this data from Houston, and I have other, no, this is California. I have other data from Houston, and I just I give them lots of data. So I want you to look at the yellow bar, which is two-way immersion, and the blue bar, which is the transitional. First, second, third, fourth, fifth grades, the yellow bar is highest. These kids are doing better in English reading. And they spent 50 to 90% of a day in Spanish. That makes no sense. But it's true. Here's their English writing. Again, look at that yellow bar. It's higher. Look at math in English. They learned, my kids are in a dual language school, they do math in Spanish. They learn dos más dos son cuatro. But when they sit down for a test and it says two plus two, they know what it is, right? So you want your kids to learn more English? Is what you should tell these parents? Great, put them in a heritage language program. That's how they'll learn it. I kind of think of it like as a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Okay, so our kids show up with peanut butter. Peanut butter is Lithuanian or Spanish or Arabic. They show up with peanut butter. What do they need? They need jelly. Jelly is English, right? We all know jelly is important in a society. You can't get far in this society without jelly, okay? But what we're learning is the more peanut butter you have on your bread, the better the jelly sticks to the bread. We want little peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. That's what we want all our children to be, is little peanut butter jelly sandwiches, right? And these parents, this kid's parents, <coughs> They're jelly sandwiches and they think that's not cool. We want our kid to be, we, our kid needs some peanut butter. So we're gonna send them to school with these little peanut butter kids and then the peanut butter and the jelly kids learn from each other. And then they all become peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. 
right? Does that make you hungry? I made you a little hungry. But I just said that. But I think it's important for parents to see these results so that they understand. Look at the studies that are coming out. Stanford University, Portland Immersion, North Carolina, on and on and on. And a lot of these are low-income, at-risk minority students, at least the cases that I tend to be looking at. Now, what isn't going to surprise you is that when you test their Spanish, their Spanish is also stronger. That's kind of a dub, right? You know, they're studying in Spanish, their Spanish is going to be better. Now, why is their English better? Why does your jelly stick to your bread better if there's peanut butter on it? Okay? Part of the reason is that the children are not falling behind. <coughs> when they show up and they don't speak English, every year they fall a little more behind because they don't, as they're acquiring the language. Does that make sense? Okay? This way, at least they're understanding what's going on as they go. In addition, and I think this cannot be overstated, their identity is valued and respected. When a Chinese-speaking child is in an all-English context, her language is seen as a what? Asset. In the all-English program? Well, no. In the all-English program, the Chinese, the Lithuanian, the Arabic, the Spanish, problem. Those children's home language is seen as a problem. It's getting in the way. If they just didn't have that, they'd be fine. It's seen as a problem. In the dual language programs, their language is seen as an asset. So you see, regular English programs want to get the peanut butter out of you. They just want jelly sandwiches. That's it. They don't want, they don't care about, they prefer the peanut butter wasn't there. But if you show up to one of these dual language programs that wants you to be a PB and J, and you, they want your pee, they want your peanut butter. Do you see what I mean? That child is valued. That child is positioned, is knowledgeable. That child is a resource to the little, in our Spanish case, the little guayitos who need to learn Spanish. They are suddenly like, they're not Juanito who doesn't know anything because he doesn't know English. They're like, ooh, Juanito knows how, I'm gonna, I better ask him. How do I say this, right? I think that does wonders for a child's self-esteem and, and school performance, okay? Um, what about those home English-speaking kids? Does their English suffer? That's the number one, number two, and number three question that parents ask. I, I like this idea of dual immersion. I want my kid to learn Arabic, but not at the cost of their English, right? Well, what we see is that no, their English does not <coughs> suffer, plus they learn the other language, right? Okay. Um, things that we know about bilingual child development, there can be a short period in which the child seems a little bit delayed. And they can produce things like Papi don't greet and Papi peace me. And their Spanish looks fun, like my kid once said, Santa Claus me bringo los regalos. <laughs> so they do stuff like that, it's normal. Um, but with sufficient exposure, they will go through the same stages as a monolingual child. Here's what I like to tell parents, and maybe this will work for you too. I tell parents, do you know the story of the three little pigs? Okay. So that first pig makes his house out of straw, okay? That's real quick. But what happens when the wolf comes? End of the house. This is all English instruction. If you put the kid in all English instruction, you're typically gonna end up, typically, not always, but you typically end up with a straw house, okay? What about the wood house? Took a little longer, didn't it? A Little bit stronger of a house? This is like a transitional bilingual education program. Okay? But when the wolf comes, same thing is still going to happen. Okay? That brick house, man, it takes a long time to build. And when you're looking at test scores in second grade, third grade, fourth grade, you're kind of going, oh my God, the <laughs> test scores are not as high as they are over in that school district. What's going on? This must be a bad idea. You're experimenting with my kid. This isn't cool. Okay? But what we find is that if you just are patient, the wolf comes, does not blow it down. And what does the wolf represent? in this metaphor, low levels of English, low levels of the heritage language, and for a lot of kids it can mean academic failure. We know that the Latino education gap in this country is abysmal. It's, it's just abysmal, it's unconscionable, right? Um, and we saw the data that this is true. So if the parents are concerned about low test scores in the early elementary years, you can point this out to them, you just gotta hang in there, we have the research that shows that they'll come through it, okay? There are clear uh, cognitive and academic advantages to bilingualism, but we need truly bilingual programs, okay? With um, immersion uh, uh, starting from kindergarten, okay? How many dual immersion programs are there in, in the country? Cal has a database. 
Okay? The thing is, you have to opt into the database. You have to go online and put yourself in it. That database lists 458 around the country, which is kind of a low number. But the good news is, unofficial estimates place it between 1,000 and 2,000. We got to get those people to go to the Cal database and put their information in, right? Um, even if we had 10,000, let's say there was 10,000 dual emergent schools in the country, most kids still would not be getting dual language education. So if somebody ever gave me a magic wand and I got one wish, that would be it. Every single child in this country would go to school through two languages. Now, we can fight about which language, and what if you have 10 languages at the school, right? Spoken by the kids, what do you do? We'll figure that out later, right? As long as they're at least two in the school, okay? Um, some wonderful examples from New York. There's Fabrice Jomont. Every time in New York City dual language school, I see Fabrice's face there. Like, he, he is the man. Everything he touches turns to dual language, it seems. So he's a real good guy to uh, talk to. Now, if you can't get the dual language school, what alternatives do you have? Well, we have Saturday schools. How many here work in Saturday schools? Okay. Um, Saturday schools are available in many, many languages, but not so much Spanish. I don't know why. That's what Joy mentioned earlier when she said, hey, there's a program out here in Spanish. I, I ran. I didn't walk. I ran out here to see what this program is all about. Um, the winner is Korean. Who does Korean here? Anybody? Okay, well, they're not here, but Korean is the winner of the Saturday school uh, competition. Over 1,200 schools serving 60,000 students around the country. Okay. Um, there are a lot of challenges, aren't there, in Saturday schools? Yeah? Okay. Um, there is some research out there that shows that Saturday schools can have a really positive effect. This was a student of mine, Aurelia. I never could pronounce her last name well. Lithuanian people, could you do it, please? I just call her Aurelia. Um, she did a study on Lithuanian schools in Chicago and found a very strong connection between maintaining Lithuanian in the third generation. Remember that third generation, that little kid? Because they attended the Heritage Saturday School. However, we shouldn't rest on our laurels. A lot of other research suggests that there is no correlation. This is so sad and depressing to me. How could there be no correlation between attending a Saturday school and heritage language proficiency? Well, what Kimmy Kondo Brown has suggested, sometimes, you, yeah, let's face it, the kids are, I don't want to go to Saturday school. <laughs> I'd rather stay at home. And da, da, da. But I'll tell you what, when they grow up and they get to college, they are always so grateful. So grateful. They say to me, I am so glad my parents made me go to Polish Saturdays. I hated it. I hated it, but I'm so glad. Because now I'm bilingual and I'm biliterate. They never say to me, oh my god, I wish I wasn't bilingual and biliterate. <laughs> never. They're always grateful, okay? Um, what Kimmy Kondo Brown found, however, uh, one of the reasons she thinks the kids were getting turned off was that the curriculum they used were designed for homeland students. And not for, let's face it, these kids are American. They're being raised in the US. You may think you're doing a good thing by, I'm gonna give them Polish curriculum from Poland because they're Polish and I want them to see the culture of Poland and the way we educate people in Poland. And the kids are like, uh, you know, for good or for bad, they're American and they're here. And shouldn't we adjust our curriculum to meet them where they're at. Does that make sense? Okay, that was something that she found. I'm gonna conclude here in a minute because I have to open the floor for questions and answers. Here's a moderately shameless self-promotion. It's the book that uh, Amelia mentioned earlier, Heritage Language Teaching, Research, and Practice. The publisher said I could give away five free electronic copies today. <laughs> so Joy, I'm gonna have to let you decide. Sorry, what did you say? I, I said this is a moderately shameless self-promotion about the book that Amelia mentioned. Awesome. And the publisher allowed me to give away five free electronic copies today. What is my So okay. maybe what we'll do later is we'll have do a, a drawing. A drawing? Yeah. Okay. We'll do a drawing yeah. later. That way you have to stay all day, right? Um, so that's what we'll do. Also, this here is free. Uh, you've probably seen it. If you haven't seen it, you need to run out and see it. This is free. You just have to sign up for an account. It is done by the National Heritage Language Resource Center. They are modules that talk about heritage language education. Super, super helpful. You can 
I don't know, take a picture of this or just go to my website and you'll, or go Google, Star Talk, um, Heritage yeah, Languages, and, and you'll find it. Okay, there she's taking the picture. Okay, somebody's taking the picture. Th these slides are also going to be on the uh, conference website. Yes. Okay, so they will be there for you. Um, so we have dual language, we have Saturday schools. What else do we have? We have after school <laughs> programs. Again, Fabrice Jomont, he's everywhere, okay? So he's got the French Heritage Language Program after school in New York City. I had a chance to visit one uh, this past spring. Uh, my gosh, there were students, where's Jane? There were students from Burkina Faso and from where else? Everywhere. Every, okay, everywhere. There were students from everywhere. We'll hear from them soon. Okay, yes, go to Jane's talk and she'll tell you. speaking next, so. Okay, Jane's speaking next, so I'll let her do it. Um, here's me in Italy. Guess what? There's a million Ecuadorians. Who knew? People from Ecuador in northern Italy. And I went, I was invited to go check out their program. They have an after school program as well. So this is a good thing that's happening. What else do you have? You have K through eight foreign language classes, okay? Here's what was happening in Chicago. Uh, about a third of Chicago public schools teach foreign languages, right? We're not waiting until they're 14, we start young. And the teachers were showing up with their books all excited. Hey, I'm gonna go teach Spanish to a bunch of second graders. And they show up and they're all Mexican kids. <laughs> so guess what? Your second language, el lapis the pencil curriculum, isn't gonna work very well. So what we did was we got a grant from the federal government to come up with a curriculum K through eight for heritage speakers, okay? And that's on my website too if you wanna take a look at it. So if your school has a foreign language program and you've got heritage speakers in there, you have a de facto heritage language program and you should treat it as such to the degree that you can, okay? However, how many elementary schools in this country have foreign language education? Grades K through five is only a third. Six through eight is a little bit higher. This was back in 1997. Do you think it's increased? Oh wait, I put decline. Never mind. I told you the answer. It's a decline. It has decreased. It has decreased tremendously. <coughs> so look at how six through eight dropped from 75 to 58, but then it goes back up again in high school because it's required in high school. This is goofy. This country needs a person here in Washington to sit on the federal cabinet and be in charge of non-English language instruction. We already have the English language instruction people. In fact, they renamed the Office of Bilingual Education to the Office of English Language Acquisition, because that's all that anybody cares about, right? We need somebody else whose job it is, is to make sure all people in the U.S. become bilingual, okay? Have you ever heard of the seal of biliteracy? Yes. You have, good. This is an award that you can get in high school for showing a high, and you can show it in a number of different ways, that you are bilingual and biliterate. Do you know how many states have this now? A lot. I didn't count them, but there's a lot. All those blue ones have the seal. The light blue ones are considering it. So that's pretty awesome. If your state doesn't have it, you need to start shaking some trees and say, look, all these places have the seal of biliteracy. So in summary, overall, Carolina Rodriguez found that the most crucial obstacle facing community-based language schools <laughs> is lack of communication with one another. Everybody's in their silos, okay? But you all are here. This means that you have broken out of your silo, doesn't it? Right, so a big applause to everybody who is here. You are here to share with each other. Looking at what Joy told us earlier, what the people said last year, yes, somebody said, I wanna know where to apply to get grants, important. I wanna know latest research on heritage language teaching, great. I wanna know, uh, we need a collective council of heritage schools. Great idea. But you know what everybody else seems to have said? I need to meet with other community-based schools. I need to exchange. I need to share experiences. This is what it seems most of you all are clamoring for, crying for. So here are your takeaways. Here's your doggy bag, ready? You need to talk and share with each other in other heritage language programs, which is what you're here doing today. Seek out other opportunities to do it too. Joy mentioned the Midwest Heritage Language Group, um, and I'm happy to share with you information about what we're doing out there. Consider making your curriculum more relevant to US raised kids. Demand or create dual immersion schools, K through eight language programs, after school, Saturday, whatever it is. Remind parents and others that bilingualism is not detrimental and lobby for a trip. Joy, you're here in town. You can do it. I remember when Obama was my senator in Illinois, an actful 
you know, actful, yeah. uh, sent everybody a letter saying, we're going to lobby the federal government to create a position, da, 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 da. so I wrote a letter to my Senator Barack Obama, and he wrote me back, well, the stamp, so he wrote back. but you know, I got a letter back saying, thank you, that's a great idea. Just that. Just that. Well, you know, not, it was da 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 summary. That's a great idea. So, what can I say? What if 10,000 of us were like, we need a foreign language person up in the federal government, okay? Um, reminding parents, the three little pigs, that can help them remember what the deal is. Also, we need to all change the discourse in this nation about, if you see a lady in the IHOP, did you see this video? A lady in the IHOP is yelling at a woman for speaking Spanish, stand up for that woman and say something. When you see something like this in a store, say something to those people. We need to change the linguistic culture of this nation. And I don't know if you've seen this video. I'm going to end with this video because it's cute. Everybody likes to see little kids. Um, so that we can become a nation that is English plus, not English only. I am American. In English, he is Spanish. I am American. Je parle français, anglais et espagnol. I am American. 我讲中文和英文。I'm American. In English, Americano, Madagascarano, and Canadian. In English, I am American. I'm American. I am 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 American. Unfortunately, no. Do I think young people are feeling pressure? Yeah, it's a contradictory force, isn't it? So a lot of young people are feeling, I need to be bilingual to get a certain job, but yet, I don't know, it's, an old, it's not just an older, younger generation thing. I think it has to do with ideologies. Um, it's probably more common for the younger generation to have a more multilingual ideology, right? So it's not just old versus young, but we see plenty of young people who don't share a multilingual ideology. So yes, it's helping, but it's not, you know, a panacea. This gentleman had a question? Uh, over here is Oh, okay. Yeah, I had a question for you. First of all, I want to thank you for your speech. I really enjoyed 
your presentation. I'm wondering if next time you could include American Sign Language in some of the research and the examples. I think that would be you know, a great way to reflect our language as well. Right. And my question is, we often have, there's a lot of controversy between spoken English and American Sign Language for deaf children. And so my question to you is which of those which of those between oralism and spoken English and American Sign Language has ever been researched in terms of bilingualism? Have you looked right. at that? Well, thank you for bringing that up. Your, your presence here, right in front of me, uh, if it was translated earlier, I said, we've got to have more ASL research. It was missing, and I, and I pointed that out, but you're absolutely right. Um, by the way, I did just hear that um, Gallaudet University mm -hmm. now has a female, their first female deaf president. That was like huge, right? Yeah. 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 That's awesome. Um, and I have to confess, my knowledge of, of these issues uh, uh, basically comes from the Oliver Sacks book. Oliver Sacks wrote a wonderful book um, about these topics. Anyway, um, I am not familiar with any research on ASL in this country. I do know that I saw a list, how long ago was it? There was a list of uh, growth in what languages, what non-English languages are being taught. Mm -hmm. And ASL had experienced the greatest growth in colleges and universities, yeah? I have a question, but just on that topic. Um, Laura Antetino is a person who's done a lot of research going back, I don't know, 20 years. Laura Antetino? Petito. Petito. Okay. Uh, hi. Uh, her name is Laura Ann Petito, P E T I T O. She used to be at Dartmouth. She's a, she was a professor of both psychology and linguistics, uh -huh. and she's now at the University of Toronto. She did research on, uh, I think she initially started out doing research on uh, deaf babies of, uh, deaf babies of hearing parents mm -hmm. and hearing parents hearing and uh, deaf parents right. who had hearing babies, those, both of the, those combinations. And, um, she also does a lot of research on uh, the brain stuff, like you showed, and she also has a lot of research on French and English. Right. Yeah. It, and my, I have a question sense, for later. Okay. My sense would be, and again, I have not seen research on this, but thank you for that suggestion. I'll, I'll definitely look it up so I can incorporate it next time. Um, my sense would be that a hearing, correct me if I'm wrong, a hearing child raised by signing parents uh, is akin to a heritage speech. They're bilingual, and maybe there's a, since, I don't know if that makes any sense. I think um, that her research showed that, and also showed that the children went through the same benchmarks, regardless of whether they were learning in sign or learning in um, a spoken language. Okay. <laughs> so I don't know, that really doesn't, I, I'm afraid, answer your question very well, but thank you for bringing it up. Um, and next time I will have a better answer for you. Could I ask my question? Thank you so much. Do you mind if I ask my question sure. as long as I have to think? Um, <coughs> what is the status, if any, that you could report on for uh, returning Obama, because that's what it used to be before George Bush, um, returning to uh, an Office of Bilingual Education? Do you have any knowledge about what's going on on that level? No. I have no. So she's asking, so the Office of Binor Bilingual Education and Minority Language Affairs was renamed, as I mentioned, um, the Office of English Language Acquisition, reflecting very clearly the ideologies of this country. She's asking, will it go, ever go back to, I don't know, um, I don't know. I think, <laughs> can I say something political? Sure. I won't say it, you know what I'm gonna say. Yeah. If certain people get elected, <laughs> no, it won't, then there's no chance. Um, I can tell you this, and maybe this is a sign of certain things. You may know that in 1998, state of California voted to outlaw bilingual education, the transitional one, right? The, the little baby crutch. They don't even want crutches. <laughs> bilingual, <laughs> California outlawed crutches, okay? Um, and now, oh, and then Arizona followed, and then Massachusetts followed, and Colorado was about to follow. You know why that measure failed in Colorado? 
it was a, what they call a Pyrrhic victory. Well, yeah, uh, soccer moms were running around in the suburbs knocking on doors and saying, you don't want those children in your children's classes, do you? Don't eliminate bilingual education. Keep bilingual education so they can put all the brown kids there. That's exactly what happened in Colorado. So yeah, it was a victory, but at a pretty high racist cost. Um, anyway, California right now, November 8th, will be voting to repeal Proposition 227. Right. So they might get rid of, yeah, they might get rid of the anti-bilingual and return, at least return the crutches. <laughs> and then see what, if that's a sign of things to come, then maybe we can be uh, uh, positive about that. Okay, this gentleman's been waiting question. really patiently one, here. Oh, sorry, okay, then two more questions. Tommy and Bear, and then we'll go. Okay. So do you want to give her that microphone? She has, I will, but she has the mic first. So. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, okay. Oh, I'm pretty loud. Okay. Yeah. We're recording. We're recording. Oh, you're recording. <laughs> okay, so Tommy and then Bear. One of your last slides indicated that the, uh, uh, there's a decline K K to eight right. grade. Uh, do you know? Can you share? You know, what was the main reason for that decline? Um, well, as you know, uh, school public school budgets are a lot of times at the whim of public sentiment, and the first thing that gets cut is music, and the second thing that gets cut is language. And if parents kind of, you know, we talked about the general ideology or attitude in this country. You know, if they said let's cut math, there's the enough for. Um, but let's cut language. Well, okay. It's, I, I just, people don't value it, and, and we're facing extreme budget cuts. I can tell you in Chicago, they just voted uh, to strike again because they've cut thousands of teacher positions, they've closed down tons of schools, um, in spite of the fact that we have a large student population. So, you know, public education is extraordinarily beleaguered in this country, unfortunately. And these are things that are seen as, as extras. That's my sense. Uh, I came to the U.S. to work about, study about translanguaging. <coughs> I'm sorry? Translanguaging. Uh-huh. And I was wondering, uh, you mentioned about code switching. Do, is there any, um, do you prefer code switching than translanguaging? <coughs> code switching is one of many practices involved in Yeah, yeah, of course. That's how I see it. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. I'm, I'm sorry.